Hey guys, welcome back, and we are now live, but you'll be watching the replay of this. Welcome back to Malifo Corner with Mars and Alex. Uh, today we are going to also extend the part where, it, you know, how to become a better Malifo player, but today we're going to talk about what, Alex? We're going to be talking about the top in-game mistakes made and how to avoid them or how to correct them once they've already happened. So those kinds of mistakes where it's like, oh, I didn't mean to do that, or uh, more along the lines of... Oh, I forgot to do that happens yeah, all the time. Yeah, oh, so what do we do now? Because we now know what those cards are, so we can't really take it back. So yeah. they happen to all of us. How do you sort them out? Without any specific order, um, we, have, we compiled a list of the things that usually happens you know, common mistakes that happen during gameplay. Uh, I'm probably going to be doing the question. If I have an answer for it, then I'll give you the answer. But I'll just start from the, the list that we compiled. Uh, number one is forgotten, terrifying, or manipulative test. Or just forgetting to do a test in general. So, um, Alex, how do you re recommend to backtrack on this? Or, you know... Well, first, yeah, first let's just clarify what we mean. So let's say that your opponent is attacking you or you're attacking your opponent and you've already made the da attack flip. Maybe you succeeded and made the damage flip and you're like, oh, you know, uh, we, we've already, we've ar or we forgot terrifying or manipulative and it might be a really important one, like say terrifying 13 all. And you're like, man, that damage shouldn't even go through. Um, how, do you, how do you handle that? Well, it really, for me in my games, it really depends on how much cheating went on, what the cards flipped. Like, if, if there was no cheating, or if you caught it right after cards were flipped, then I normally will take that first card aside that we already know is, say, the attack. And then we'll flip one more card and say, okay, that's the terrifying check. And if you pass the terrifying check, uh, great, moves on with that first card you flipped. And if you fail the terrifying check, then okay, you have a chance to cheat that, and then back to business as usual. Um, the second card that was flipped would be for the attack flip now, right? No, I don't shift what was flipped for what uh, okay. generally, but you could. I mean, that that's something you can sort out with your opponent. If instead it's like, oh, the top card, there it is, and you know, okay, that one's for my terrifying check instead. Eh, that's fine. But, like, if, it depends where you're at in the process. If there's already been uh, cheating, if there's already been a damage flip associated, and someone's like, oh, you know, I forgot the terrifying check. You know, it, especially in casual games, I'll definitely make that concession. You know, when we get to tournament level or whatnot, um, you'll find some people who are like, well, for the next attack, you know, it maybe it's only the first AP has been spent. So the second attack would be, okay, well, now make your terrifying check. The first one is too dumb to realize that this thing's scary, you know. So, uh, And this happens a lot, especially with Reserve Player. It doesn't matter if you're the opponent of a Reserve Player or if you're you know the the actual reserve player, player, but I I think in the sense of sportsmanship, if I was not the reserve player and I knew that my opponent needed to make a fear check or like a terrifying check, I usually recommend don't forget your terrifying check. Or you know if the turn before he forgot to do it, then I would say like, hey, don't forget your terrifying check. Right, and for me as ten thunders. And as I'm bringing you over, Mario, to the dark side, like <laughs> illuminated. I always forget that they're terrifying. It's like the oh, okay. ten. Hey, ten living, make that check. So, um, really, just try to make the cards sort out as best you can uh, to not really confuse the issue on where those cards should have landed. And, and talk to your opponent and make just come to an agreement, really, is where that ends up. If it's too complicated and too many cards have been flipped, eh, skip it. Do it the next one. Yeah. Like, I mean, like you said, emphasis on casual play, then you can do it. But if it's a tournament and if it's going to slow down the play because you already have a limited time, then just skip it and remember it next time. I mean, it doesn't matter whose advantage it is. If it's already done, then it's already done. Right. All right, number two on the list. This also happens a lot of times. <laughs> Flipping too many or too soon. What do you do with the extra revealed cards? This one goes back and forth. Sometimes people try to put stuff back on the top of their deck. 
um, especially if you're in Vassal and you have the undo button. Um, that always leaves kind of a bad taste in the air on what's going on on the table because you're like, oh, well, what are you, what are you going to do next with that King of Crows that you now know is on the top of your deck? So um, I'll normally just burn whatever cards are already out and just call it good. It w it may be my fault, it, you know, I might not have been thinking, or it, for whatever reason that it happens, just muck them and let it go because it sucks, but maybe it, it's something you should take note on that maybe you're just playing too fast. Maybe, maybe you need to take a, a moment and make sure you have your fate modifiers correct. Maybe you have, you know... You make sure you're having that conversation with your opponent. Oh, you're hard to wound? Oh, okay. You know, you, you have to have that moment because you flip too many cards or too few and you're already you're already committed. So that's where I'm at. Yeah, I think you should like if you're a tournament organizer or you know, if you're if you're in a, a tournament play as well, you should just standardize it so it doesn't matter if I flip too soon or too many cards, then just leave it. Uh, I would actually agree with that too, because I'm not going to even argue with that. Because if you try to say, "Oh, can I put that back?" if it's a high card, and if it's a low <laughs> card, I'd be like, "Yeah, I'll just let it go." It, it follows along within the sport sportsmanship. So I think just have a standardized rule. If the card is already open, it'll never come back to the deck. Right. Right. And and really, as from a TO's perspective, because I've generally run a lot more tournaments than I play in, like, I'll leave it to my players. If they want to talk to me about it, then I'll make a decision. But, you know, yeah, that's kind of... I, I agree, that's kind of where we stand on a general level. So... Uh, Alright. Well, let's go on with number three. Uh, this also happens a lot, especially if your, your crew has a lot of trigger. It's trigger timing. Calling it during damaging, or is that too late? Um, I, this actually happens during the last tournament that I was in, and then my opponent would say, we should have done this before the damage. Um, or sometimes, you know, you can actually call it before uh, your opponent flip his card. Or, I mean, you're supposed to flip the card at the same time, but sometimes your opponent's delaying it a little bit. Uh, so what, what's your take on this, Alex? For trigger timing, like, it, it depends. If it's a trigger that you know is worked in, and you, you know as the suit's included, it's something that person always does. Oh, they have a ram that's always critical strike. You know, oh, you know, it's a crow. Oh, that guy's going to give out slow uh, all the time. That's one thing. Um, if I'll normally allow that. If, if it's like, okay, I'm going to do that and your guy's slow. I'm like, wait a minute, where'd slow come from? Oh, it's the trick. I'll normally allow that. But if it's something that comes with, or that, that really could have affected something due to, like, the cheating decision. If you're just saying, oh, um, I've got a six of whatever, and I'm moving on to damaging, here's my flip for damage, and say it's, you know, decapitate or something like that, and you're like, wait a minute, wait, 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 I, I would have cheated if you, you know, if, if yeah, yeah. I didn't know, you know, then it might be a little bit more, but that's, that's kind of the difference again between tournament and casual, or, uh, more often than not, I would mirror what my opponent does in that scenario. Because if my opponent is or is is sportsmanly on the same page as I am, which I'm not saying that being that literal in the rules is wrong. I'm just saying like if he's being loose with it, I'll be loose with it. If he's very okay, you have to declare this during the, or the attack duel before damage cards are flipped. I will make sure that I do that every single time. Mm -hmm. So I personally will mirror more often than I will. I will, you know, be a stickler on it. But I think that if it if it's a common if it's a common trigger throughout the game, I, I'll let it be. Now I heard from the across the pond, <laughs> actually, when you're I don't know how many times that. Uh, this happens, but I heard that people it, on the other side of the pond in the UK, when they play Malifaux tournament, um, they actually don't tell you about the trigger. You're expected to know your opponent's trigger. I I don't know if that's even necessarily just in UK. A lot of the folks that I play will either force you to ask, what triggers are you threatening right now? Mm -hmm. 
Um, or yeah, you're just expected to know because it's part of you know it, it's kind of in that deception uh, in Chronicles 15. It was in that article that it was talking about. Oh well, you don't have to give them all the information. So yeah. I think that's kind of a personal play style choice. But uh, I generally won't. Uh, give out the trigger information unless it's something that's happening over and over and over and over again, like with those included triggers. It's not like I have to tell you that I'm going to trigger critical strike every single time with someone with an included ram in the guild. So, uh, yeah. For me, in general, I usually tell the trigger right before I flip the damage. I'd be like, hey, I have critical right now. Do you, do you, you want to stand with your card? Do you want to cheat? So I right. Have to tell and, and that's the important thing as far as preventing that kind of a mix-up is giving them that opportunity. Are you done cheating? Yes. It's not like, okay, you're at a you're at a 10, I'm at a 20, cool, let's move on and trigger and damage. You know, it's not, you yeah. don't fastball them, you just, you know, give them that opportunity. And I, I think that somewhere between those two options of not telling them but making sure they're comfortable with their decision not to cheat, um, therein lies probably the best road. And if they ask, then you tell them. If not, then, you know, you assume they know. Yeah. Going down again to number four, defensive soul stones. Um, do you let him spend it after the flip? Um, I see this a lot, actually, uh, because a lot of people in my local meta don't use soul stones for defense. So it's just like, okay, I'm going to attack you with X and flip. And they're like, oh, oh I, wa I wanted to... Uh, so in my local groups or even the Vassal games, I play, I let them do it. I, I'm like, oh, burn the card for, or burn the soul stone for, for defense because generally the flow of the game, you know, kind of gets away with people when they're really excited to kill something important. Um, I also find that a lot of people aren't exactly proactive with defensive soul stones. Like it's not something they think about and volunteer before you flip your cards to attack. Especially uh, if you're coming from a 1.5 perspective where you flip, I mean, use a soul stone afterwards. Yeah, yeah. So it, it, as long as, like, there's not a delay of thinking, like, hmm, do I want to spend that stone just yet? You know, I'll be like, you know, yeah, yeah sure. Let, let them have it because, in all honesty, uh, if they have that many stones to burn, then you might as well let them, in my opinion. I I have nothing against that. I mean, usually, <laughs> usually I just like if you want to burn it, yeah, sure. But then if it's a tournament play, I usually keep everything into like one standard rule. Like, sorry, you're supposed to flip this. I mean, use the soul stone, declare soul stone usage before any flip. Then right. that goes for defensive or anything that you want to do. And again, with that whole mirroring my opponent thing, like with like initiative flips, if you're with you know stoning for more cards, anything like that, uh, whatever level they are comfortable being at, I I'm laid back enough that I'll I'll adapt whatever I think to them, uh, to to that standard. Uh, and it's only if something is like, you know, top table at Adepticon or something, it might be like, I might have that conversation before the game. It's like, you know, let's just make sure that we're all on the same page to start. Because no one really likes to play with someone that it's going to end up being an I gotcha. You know, like, a, oh, you're going to make me make this horrible decision of allowing you to do this because it's sportsmanly or screwing over my own model. No one wants to be in that scenario where I have to cut my own throat in order to be sportsmanly. Yeah. So uh, that's what we're trying to avoid. Or you might just sound like a pushover that people can do yeah. that over and over to you. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. All right. Uh, number five on the list is the illegal list, like that one oh. soul stone extra on the crew list. Dang it. <laughs> what What do you do in this situation? Let's say if you're a player in a casual and you're a player in a tournament, you're a tournament organizer. What would you do? So the important part here is, is the stone spent? So is it a stone that was spent for an upgrade? Or is it just a stone left in the cache? And this gets really mucky when it gets to the tournament level. On casual play, eh, 
you know, who really cares unless it was spent on, you know, that extra upgrade that there's no way you should have been able to fit into that list and you've got Killjoy and Rail Gollum and, you know, all these horrible things breathing down your neck and, like, ooh, that one upgrade turned the tide of the game. Um, so that, that just leaves a bad taste in your mouth and, like, yeah, eh, it, it sucks, but you, you check the person double next time in a casual setting. When it comes to a tournament level... From a player standpoint, it's kind of hard to catch because uh, normally the pace as a player, you're really moving kind of fast. Yeah, you got ten minutes start up. You don't have time to check your opponents. Yeah, does, does normally it's the exchange of cards. That's what you've got. Cool. I, I try to work in a little bit of math, but normally I see it creep in only in cash size. Like, normally, because if you're handed the upgrades and the cards, you can tally them real quick. Cool. Good. Moving on. Uh, but cash size might get you. So in that case, um, if it gets noticed, then, you know, you just penalize the guy a stone real quick. Or, you know, I mean, there's not a lot. Once it's been played, there's not a lot you can do about it. Uh, if it's a, a high-stakes game or whatnot and you want to call a TO, then that's up to you. But as far as, from a TO standpoint, if the list itself is illegal and you get either through the game or halfway through the game, that's when it gets into sticky and disqualification, you know. Yeah, because item. halfway of the point, like, which upgrade are you going to discard? What well, if it's a model that's already dead? There's, there's too much that's already happened. There's models that have died. There's, you know, defensive that have been made. You know, it's, it's probably made too much of an impact already. So I would weigh it as a TO to how important is the game. Are we talking, you know, people within placing range? Are we talking, you know, the bottom full quarter? You know, if it's the bottom quarter, you know, then you just work it out between them with either if you want to uh, either you know award stone, take away stone, take away the model that's offending, you know, something like that. Um, if you are on one of the top tables, then you have to look at just, you know, straight disqualification or maybe restart the match it depending on how far into the game you already are uh, and where you're at in the schedule. If it's like the last game of the day and you're playing top table, I might extend, you know, the tournament time by an extra 20 minutes to let them start that portion over with a corrected list. Or if not, then you just have to DQ the person who, you know, has the offending list. Now let that. me let me throw you a wrench here. Hit me. So let's say you're, you're the tournament organizer. Yeah. And this is the top match right now, yep. one and two. And number two has an illegal list by two soul stones, or one, doesn't matter, but it's a soul stone that cannot be spent anymore, so it's just going through over cash. Uh-huh. And uh, even though number one seeded is playing within it, I mean, at the disadvantage, and he still won, would you disqualify number two and would not get number two place? Um, I would then look at the differential and see if that extra advantage in the last game, was it 10 to 9? Was it a complete blowout and number one, you know, demolished them? Because if it's really close, then you still might have to disqualify them because differential might tie into the final standing. Yeah, because, I mean, he could be tied in differential with number three or four. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Or someone who had an awesome game who was in fourth or fifth place and could jump up. So you have to look at the effect of the game and decide if it's worth the karma of the tournament to, to say that you disqualified someone, in my opinion. If this person got blown out in the top table and they sink down to sixth place and, you know it made the difference between 6th place and 5th place, uh -huh. eh, I'll probably let it go, but I'll, I'll make the announcement probably, you know, with a little, <laughs> you know, next time, do your math a little better, buddy. Um, <laughs> but I, I probably won't penalize them by disqualifying them. If it makes the difference between 1, 2, and 3, then, yeah, I'll probably, I'd probably make the call that they won't place and just bump everyone else up. Okay. All right, now we're, we're going back. I mean, we're going towards our next segment, which is the preventative methods 
or what you could do to prevent all this from happening. I mean, other than remembering it, obviously. Yes. <laughs> if you're bad at math, we can't help you there. Um, actually, using Crew Creator on your phone is a yes. great way Tablet. to get it ready. Now, if or, you want to use print out your list before that. Well, come on, Mario. Not all of us come to a tournament with lists already put together. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah. So, um, but these these are some habits you can get into that will really help your game go smoothly and prevent some of these from happening. Um, first on the list that is kind of I don't know if this is based from other card games that people might play, but my my big suggestion is do not flip cards from the top of your deck into your discard pile. I see this happen a lot with newer players because they're like, oh, I'm going to discard it anyway. So they just make their flip immediately into the discard pile. The reason you shouldn't do this is because when you get into fate modifiers one way or the other, then it's really hard to discern how many you flipped, especially if you're like a flip or two into it. And... You're like, oh, that card wasn't supposed to be there. Okay, which ones did you flip? You know, and then like with our terrifying manipulative test example earlier, how do you know which card would have been where when you're, you know, oh, that was a triple positive flip. Which one of the triple positive would have been your, uh, would have been the appropriate card? And I, I know all of you are sitting at home saying, well, the first one. You know, and but I, I've seen people as as play happens. You just they they will flip the three cards, take the highest one, put it on top, and then put all of them into the discard pile, leaving the highest card on top. And so it's just like, well, you know. Well, for this it. for this part, I actually even go even further with a staggered type. So let's say the discard pile is all the way to the right, and then my deck is all the way to the left, and then I put the flip cards in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. And then let's say if that's for the attack, I'll push them up, and then the damage will be on the below that. Okay. Yeah, I mean that's that's that takes it one step further. So you you can see the entire path of the duel, you know, and the result all at once, and then you discard. Um, but I mean the rule book even suggests things like with an attack duel, you lay them all out, and then if you're gonna cheat discard those previous cards and put the cheated card out so that you're not confused by the other cards. Yep. And I think that's really sound advice that people kind of gloss over. So that, that would be the first habit to get into. Um, and the second one that we have is if it sounds really overly powerful, <laughs> you might want to check it. If you, yeah, if you have that like soul-crushing moment where you're like, it does what? You know, you're like, the game is just about to fall apart. Um, ask your opponent to see the card. Yeah. And that kind of ties into our next point is, don't ever be afraid to look at the cards or the rule book and make sure that poison ignores armor. You know, that... Uh, that poison only takes one tick every time in a turn instead right. of, like, that, burning. That, that Lucia, I've seen this one. That Lucius, his red tape doesn't last for the end of the game. Like, you know, that whole, like, end of the game versus end of the turn, make sure you know when conditions end, because that's huge. So ask to see the cards. Sometimes people forget. They get things confused. It's not a big deal. Just quickly ask to check it out and, yep. and move on. Well, the only time it's wrong when you ask questions to look at the rule book is when you purposely slow play. Well, yes. Yeah, no one wants to... All the the caveat for all of these how to be a better Malifo players is you're trying to be the best player on all levels. <laughs> yeah, not, trying not, to be not pulling slow play or anything like that out of the hat. So um, the next one that I like uh, to make sure that I'm doing, and especially if I'm winning or losing, is try to maintain a pace that allows for interjections from your opponent. So, you know, that, oh, I want to spend that soul stone. Are you ready for initiative? I need to, uh, you know, stone for cards real quick. You know, make sure you're not moving so fast that your opponent feels rushed. And I know this flies in the face of what that deception article talked about. Like, oh, you notice your opponent doesn't make good choices when you rush him, so try to rush him. 
Well, you know, I find that in when you're trying to play those kind of meta games during a game, you end up with more mistakes that puts you in this kind of a category. So um, I like to make sure I keep it a, a moving pace, but it doesn't speed up or slow down with how I play. I kind of hit a rhythm with how my turn's going so that my opponent knows that if he wants to cheat, if he wants to stone, that he has, you know, I don't know how much it would actually be, like a two-second window after I declare an attack that he can, you know, pipe up before cards... Well, are... rhythm is actually also another topic that we can talk about. It's true, and that was also in that article talking about, you know, breaking your opponent's rhythm, and, you know... That's fine. If if someone wants to try to break my rhythm, it really it's just going to end up in slower play that's going to penalize both of us. Because I, I'll guarantee you, you won't rush me through the game, but we can slow it down. And so that's something as a player, you need to know yourself, like, am I being rushed? Do I feel frantic in what I'm doing? And take yourself out of that mindset, because even from a strategy point of view, you're going to make mistakes if you're rushed, and if you lose the game, you want to lose because you got outplayed, not because you just forgot rules or how to play your own models. Cool. And the last one? Um, I think it's probably the best habit to get into is to casually confirm steps with your opponent. Now, like we were talking about earlier, I don't think you'd be like, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to declare critical strike, you know, are you sure you don't want to cheat it? So, you know, not that, but allowing your opponent the opportunity to cheat, like your example, Mario, of, okay, so we're six apart, are you going to cheat? Okay, moving on. And make sure you do it when you have a trigger, when you don't have a trigger, um, when you're winning, when you're losing, just make sure that that's all squared away before you move to the next step, and that way both players feel like, okay, I know where we're going, we're not rushing, we're not slow playing, everything's going fine. So, are you ready for initiative? Alright, let's go. Yeah, I've um, never you... met any opponent that does not appreciate the fact that you're reminding him or her to do certain things, like, you know, cheating on a trigger or something. Well, I mean, yeah, you don't, you don't have to, like we were talking about, but like, saying, okay, so cheating's done. Not just looking at flipped cards and being like, cool, I'm winning by 12. All right, next card. You know, like, don't just try to short hop into the damage phase. Um, especially confirming the end of turns. Like, okay, is your activation done? Um, okay, so that's the end of the turn, right? Because a lot of the times, I've seen this um, where people will forget to activate a model, but you'll move on to the next turn and start playing like, oh, I forgot that last turn. That's okay. I'd say keep playing forward. But, like, if your opponent isn't done and they were going to declare a zero and you started doing your models thing, then I think that's a little bit on the unsportsmanly side because you just jumped into your activation and kind of uh, shorted them the end of their turn. So if, if instead you just have this open dialogue with your opponent as far as what step of the game you're on, I think everyone has a better game. Now, I mean, despite being a stereotypical player or war gamers are being antisocial, the games <laughs> are actually helping you to become more social with your opponent. It is a very social game that you're supposed to talk. You know, you're not supposed Absolutely. to be, you're not supposed to be a robot playing. I'm moving this. I'm moving I that. find that the yeah the best the best war gaming experiences I've had are very social, very open, laughing games. Even when they're highly competitive, both people are just stand-up folks that, you know, you're there to have fun, but you're there to challenge the other person and yourself. So, you know, have that conversation. You know, you don't got to make small talk if you don't want to, but, you know, don't shut down and just... Yeah, like, you know, don't ask him, did you get laid last night or anything? <laughs> don't talk about something about the game. That might, that might be the bridge too far as far as, you know, trying to distract your opponent, I don't know, but... Uh... Yeah, that, like that, one, of, yeah. one of my game, best gaming moments is, you know, we're, we're playing with toy soldiers. When we're a kid, you push your toy soldiers around and you go pew, pew, pew. <laughs> and when I get to relive that, that is one of the, you know, some of my best gaming moments. Like, for example, against Mark, we yeah. had rock and sock and robots fights. And I was like, holy crap, this doesn't happen very often. For those watching at home, uh, Mario faced a good friend of mine. Uh, they, they met in the middle, and I believe it was Lazarus versus Lazarus beating each other. No, Lazarus versus Peacekeeper. Oh, there you go. Yeah. 
and they just beat on each other forever, and nobody won. <laughs> Nobody believes. But we had fun. And but, but, but fun was the end goal, in which case everybody won. So that that's really that's really our point of the point of this video is to make sure that everyone has fun and how to handle those awkward moments. Well, well we've come to the end of Malifa Corner for this episode. And uh, today we've talked about how or the mistakes, top X mistakes. Like you know, we didn't list them in order or anything. It's just the most common mistakes that happens during gameplay and how to prevent it and how to react to it. Um, we've talked for, I don't know, probably 15, 20 minutes so far. And if you have any questions, comments, or if you want to see any other topics being covered, please subscribe, You know, like, comment down below. We appreciate all your feedback. Uh, Alex, do you have any closing thoughts? That's about it. Um... We're very open to suggestions and comments and look forward to hearing from you guys and making an interactive conversation. So thanks for watching. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> Bye, guys. See you later.